I'm Julie Arliss from Academy Conferences. I'm here at the University of Aberdeen and have the very great pleasure of being in the Divinity Library with Dr. Mike Laffin right now. And um, Mike, I'm going to ask you a question if you don't mind on, sure. on Christian ethics. Sure. Um, so, one of the questions that arises amongst our students um, is, well, why, why are we studying this? It doesn't have any relevance in a postmodern, some would argue, post-Christian culture. Why are we even studying this? Why, how is it relevant today? Sure. How, how might you... Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Thank you for that question. I, I would, I would, I would ag actually argue it, it's relevant um, in all sorts of ways. Uh, the most important way is actually how it helps us to imagine what ethics is, in fact, all about. Um, and, and I would actually say the same holds true, not just for Christian ethics, but if we think of sort of ancient ethics, so Plato and Aristotle, the kind of ethics the, the Greeks, did, the early tradition, Western mm -hmm. tradition were engaged in. Um, I, I, I think it's important uh, because there's a, there's a different kind of understanding of what ethics is actually all about. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that in many ways, in, in modern, postmodern culture, Ethics has become largely concerned with questions of sort of decision-making processes. So ethics has become about let's get the right decision procedures in place. Let's get formulas that we can then apply to hard situations or hard questions or ethical quandaries, mm -hmm. sort of boundary or borderline cases. Um, and, and so in a lot of ways, ethics, I think, gets pushed out to the margins of life. And I, I think for, for all, and I don't mean this as, a, a, as necessarily negative against bioethics, mm -hmm. but I think in some ways bioethics, because it's become so prominent in our time, yeah. at times it becomes the grounding framework for all ethical sort of inquiry, all ethical work. Mm -hmm. um, but really bioethics often is concerned with beginning of life, end of life matters, which of course ma are important. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate bioethics mm -hmm. by any means. But, but I worry that that gets right is that's what all of ethics is about. So often we have, very famously, the trolley problems, right? Yes, yes. Do, I, do I pull a switch to save three versus two or all of this? Mm -hmm. um, and again, a, a thought experiment like the trolley experiment can be very helpful in terms of sort of getting at our intuitions. What do we, what do we value? What do we care about? Um, and, and it can give us certain clarity about why we might think that way. But at the same time, I worry that, again, it's something quite marginal. How often are we going to actually have to pull switches, right, <laughs> to save lives? Um, whereas, whereas, I think Christian ethics, and again, ancient ethics as well, but Christian ethics was very much focused on what happens, what occurs at the center of life. Right. Um, so, we'll just take an example. So, I'm teaching a class right now uh, uh, for level one students on Christian ethics. And we're reading St. Benedict's Rule, which is basically a rule by which monasteries, mm -hmm. still even today, there's one just outside of Aberdeen here that, that still runs according to the Benedictine Rule. Um, but the rule is just full of prescriptions for, this is the sleeping arrangements. This is when you'll eat, how much you'll eat, what kind of food you'll eat. Um, and then what's really striking is there's, there's about, I don't know, a third of the, it seems like almost a third of the rule has to do with the use of time, and it's really sort of the liturgy of the hours. Right. So worship is scheduled, you know, seven times a day plus the night watch, so eight times a day. Um, but, the, but the point is, all of these things are just very central to everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, so how eating, sleeping, telling time, right? Just very basic, mundane, everyday things. Um, but, but for the rule, that's quite central to how we become formed as certain kinds of people. So it's, it's, it's very much concerned with um, us becoming certain types of people rather than... Through habit. Through habit, precisely, rather than gaining a certain, um, a certain procedure or a certain principle that we can then just apply in all these other... These cases we may encounter um, on the margins. Rather, it's, it's very much... Even the way we keep time is, is ethically significant. To facilitate character formation. That's right. That's right. So I, I, think, it, I, I think it gives this... One of the important things Christian ethics, I think, can do in our time is help us evaluate and see, well, what is, what is ethically significant? And right. what do the more common approaches, deontology, consequentialism, all these things, for, for, all, for all that there is to like in those approaches, what do they leave off the table? Or what do, again, do they, do they, they overlook and assume isn't ethically relevant? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, precisely as you said with Aristotle, I mean, he talks about the way the graceful person speaks, right? All these things that we might think wittiness is a virtue, right? All these things we might think that just doesn't matter. Um, but again, for Aristotle, it's, these are the habits that form us to be certain kinds of people, certain kinds of, having certain kinds of character. Mm -hmm. So I suppose in a broad sense, I would just say Christian ethics is really crucial because, because it does give our ethical imagination certain grasping points mm -hmm. that we don't find in many of the more predominant right. um, approaches so you, today. Would it be fair to say you feel that it's a more complete picture of how we do ethics? On, in, in our daily lives, or it would give us a better toolkit than utilitarianism? I, or... I, I think that's right, yeah. And, and, and what I would say too, I, I would say, yeah, because it's, it's, again, it's not just trying to find principles we can then apply all over the place, or again, usually all over the place means these very rare situations that don't actually really often arise. Um, or, or um, right, so, or, or instead of, um, Right, so in a, instead of sort of quandaries or ethical difficulties, it's much more concerned with with how do how do we go about our day to day mm -hmm. lives? How does how does that how does that affect? Um, how is that morally significant? Right. And 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 I think what what it would what is helpful again with Christian ethics, and again I think this is true of the classical tradition before mm -hmm. Christianity too, is the understanding that the community we find ourselves within is very important for the kind of person we become. Right. So for, again, going back to the, the Benedict King rule, just because I happen to teach it this week, so it's fresh on my mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but this understanding that the church is required to become this kind of person. So it's not, it's not primarily a matter of, of gaining certain knowledge, again, mm -hmm. principles or something mm -hmm. like this, but rather it's, it, it's a matter of having our wills, our affections, as Augustine famously put it, having our loves ordered in certain ways. Yes, yes. Um, and I think it's significant too, Michael Banner, who's a, a Christian ethicist I, I, I admire quite a bit, he's at Cambridge, he, he has made the point that um, really in the, early, in the early Christian tradition, it, ethics wasn't taught by Christians writing sort of ethical treatises. It was much more ethics was learned in the worship of the church, in the hymns that were sung, in the sermons that were preached, in the prayers, in the poems. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I think that that's quite true. I mean, you think of Philippians too, the famous Christ hymn and, and, and Philippians Paul and Paul's letter to the to the Philippians. And you have there you have there it's embedded in this very rich theology. So you have the this the son who is in nature God, yet takes on human form, right? This 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 Christological sort of formulation that the church spends centuries trying to clarify. Um, you have the spirit, be be one in the spirit. He talks about the commonality in the spirit. Um, so it's this like very rich theological um, text or hymn, um, and yet it's being used to appeal for humility. Right. Be, be humble like Christ is humble. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's significant because, it's, again, Paul there is, is, is pointing to what, what most scholars would say is just a, um, a hymn that would have been well known amongst the churches. So his readers right. likely had sung this, this hymn many, many times. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but I think what's, what's interesting there is, uh, again, the, the, and this is why I think Christian ethics has something to teach us about ethics, is, is the, the form of it there is, it's, it's very much just a practice of the church in which an ethos is sort of handed on. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's, it's, it's wrapped in rich theology. So it's not, we often separate ethics out as mm -hmm. something other than, yeah. say, theology. Whereas for the early church, it was very much, ethics was very much just about the life of the church. Yeah. And you That's could say, a very important distinction, isn't it? When you recognize the connection between the word ethics and ethos, and an ethos of a place is something very often that you can't capture. That's exactly right. Or, or, and, and the Benedictine rule was an attempt to show, well, if we do all these things in the right order, in the right place, at the right time, then our ethos will be preserved. But That's it doesn't right. define the ethos. It's That's just right. a facilitating That's framework right. for the ethos to arrive. Precisely. And the ethos will come through, again, the seven times a prayer a day. And yeah. all, as they worship, as they pray, they, they pray the Psalter every week. Yeah. So as they say the Psalms every week, week after week, year after year, mm -hmm. the ethos will, mm -hmm. will develop out of that. Mm -hmm. um, or will be so in the light of that, do you think that the study of ethics is a slightly artificial construct when ethics is related to ethos and ethos is something that you sort of catch and live 
Is it is it a little bit artificial to think that we can have ethical frameworks? I again, I think so. And again, this is why I think Christianity has a particular contribution, or Christian ethics has mm -hmm. a particular contribution, because often I think modern ethics thinks the way to get at all of this is we need some neutral, universal, yeah. universalizable, rational starting mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think the insight of Christian ethics is. There really is no such starting point that we we embed, we're, we're so embedded in communities. Yeah. And again, I think this is true of the of ancient sort of Greek ethics as well. Again, going back to mm -hmm. the Western tradition more broadly, mm -hmm. so we see um, right Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Mm -hmm. He begins calling this. He never calls it study ethics. He calls it politique, politics. He's studying politics, and there it's the idea that the city has this foundational role. This uh, irreducible role to play in the formation of the character of the citizens and yeah. and that actually that's the main job of the city is to educate the citizens mm -hmm. and the virtue mm -hmm. and, and and i think i think for all its differences that there's something similar in the way christian ethics has traditionally been understood yeah. where it's it's um the worship life of the church provides that sort of education into the kind of people who are the people who follow christ yeah. um and, and so again, it, it's just a quite different way of viewing ethics. Yeah. And, and we, see, we see some of this, of course, with the revival in the last 40 years or so mm -hmm. of virtue ethics. Yes. So virtue ethics has, of course, become very common once again. Um, um, and, and yeah, if we were to really push it, I would argue that that's where Christian ethics even has more to say, because I think there are certain problems with virtue ethics that right. I find Christian ethics, particularly as articulated in the time of the Reformation, what about the place, of, the place of Jesus in Christian ethics? How do you yeah? How do you how do you fit Jesus into the ethos framework and the virtue framework? How how does that? Yeah, I think I think that's that, that's really crucial. Um, and I, I tend to be um, sympathetic to Bonhoeffer and those in that stream um, and the understanding that sort of the Sermon on the Mount is is not. An ideal for a few, but it's it's actually the call for all Christians mm -hmm. to follow, which of course has some quite radical implications. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think um, that challenge is something we ought to take yeah. we ought to take seriously. Um, and again, I, I suppose when I said sort of the Reformation, I mean that trajectory, including um, Barton and Bonhoeffer, yeah. um, um, and Bonhoeffer in particular. Um, so it would be the example of um, the example of. Jesus's life and the teachings that we read of in the Gospels that you would go to in in a Christian ethics framework, not, for example, um, a pra prayer life, or, or would you want to put those all together? That's what. Yeah, I was going to say. I actually would. Yeah. I would actually argue against separating them. Okay. So I think. Yeah. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospels, absolutely should be mm -hmm. central. Mm -hmm. But I. I think we have to. If we're to approach them well, I think we approach them first as. Um, if this is, I don't know if this is quite. I don't want to use the language instrument, but 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 instruments in the worship of the church. Okay. Again, I don't want to instrumentalize scripture in that <laughs> no, way. No, no, but but, um, yeah. but 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 uh, so I suppose to truly approach or to rightfully approach mm -hmm. um, these texts, I would mm -hmm. argue we we do so first in the yeah. in the worship of the church. That it's in the church we learn what it means to read these texts, and mm -hmm. as we pray these texts in the church, we learn. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again, so sort of, I suppose, a move away from the highly individualistic approach of much modern okay. ethics. Okay. Uh, again, going back to both, I think, the more Greek Aristotelian tradition, but right. also the Christian tradition, that, the, the, that we, the, we, we need a certain community to, mm -hmm. to learn the ethos from. Right. Right. Um, and so I, I would say we, we have to, we learn what it means to live according to the Sermon on the Mount through the worship life of the church, through the prayer. And in, of the church. in modern society where many children live in, in broken homes, maybe with one parent, that community can be very, very small. That's right. So quite interesting. Um, what, what, I wonder if, if you'd like to take on this challenge. And sure. Feel free to say not to um, I wonder if you might um, show us how distinctive Christian ethics is um, by applying it to something like um, sexting. Sure. So a girlfriend or boyfriend asks you to send a naked photograph of yourself in sure. text. Does Chris, how, how, how distinctive might the approach of Christian ethics be to that kind of question? Sure, good, yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's an excellent 
example to think about. Um, yeah, so, so what I would want to say is, I think often, again, with sort of standard ethical approaches that are, are common, sort of the modern English-speaking yeah. world, we would, we would emphasize, well, the question of autonomy, mm -hmm. question of consent, well, are they old enough to consent to this? Um, um, individual rights, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and, and I'm not denying those things all matter, mm -hmm. but, but I think if those are the main anchors that tell us how to think about this, I think we'll miss some of the most significant things about what's actually going on and okay. sexting and all of this. And um, again, the Christian tradition is going to have a very rich anthropology. What does it mean to have a human, be a human being? Right. What does it mean to relate to other human beings in light of being creatures of the kind of God who created us? Um, um, what does it matter, mean that we're created in the image of God? Right, all, all these, these sorts of framing framing anchors, I think are just going to make us approach the topic in just a whole different way. Uh, and, and I think we'll probably get quite different answers because we're asking the questions. Again, I think the basic question is what's actually going on here? Mm -hmm. And I think one framework suggests, well, what's going on here is questions of autonomy and yeah. age of consent and all that. Mm -hmm. Where another one's going to say, no, what's going on here is questions of human dignity yeah. and um, sort of fulfilling what we are meant to fulfill as human beings, this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. The, the frameworks are quite... And the value being placed upon the physical and the appearance rather than on the whole person. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's right, yeah. And, and, and again, I think this would, I, I mean, without getting way into it, but I, 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 yeah, I think, I think this gets into the larger issue um, of sort of virtual reality, yeah. um, right? Whereas Christianity has always been actually quite strong against Right, Gnosticism mm -hmm. has been something Christianity has fought against mm -hmm. from its earliest days. Mm -hmm. So that this idea that material embodiment really means something. Yeah. And the, hopefully the Eucharist is teaching us, uh, again, the worship of the church week after week, mm -hmm. telling us something significant about embodiment. Right. And, and again, is sexting somehow a violation of, mm -hmm. or uh, a, a false understanding of what it means for us to be embodied creatures, embodied right. beings. Right. and how we relate to one another as embodied beings and um, how we can damage one another when we ignore all the significance right. that relates to embodiment. Yeah. So again, yeah, it's, it's just framing the questions yeah, that's so quite differently. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, that was really, yeah. really wise. Well, I hope so. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Very interesting. Thank you so thank, much. Thank you.